1892, geologist Israel Russell was sent with a U.S. Geological Survey to explore the wide open landscape of central Washington state. One of his tasks was to try to locate valuable minerals, copper, gold, or anything else that miners could take from the ground. But out in the open desert of sun-baked sagebrush and greasewood, Russell found something else. The country north of Uptanum Ridge is a rocky region in which the black basalt is scarcely concealed by the sandy soil. Across this dreary valley, fragments of fossil wood and even large parts of tree trunks, now changed to stone, show that in former ages this now desolate region was forest covered. Fragments of similar fossil trees are found scores of miles apart throughout central Washington. Israel C. Russell, 1893. Nearly 40 years later, in 1931, Professor George Beck, a geology instructor at the State College in Ellensburg, was driving along the highway near the riverside town of Vantage when he spotted a man coming down from the hills with a section of petrified log. Intrigued by what he'd seen from the road, Beck returned with his students to take a closer look. After less than a week of field work, Professor Beck arrived at a startling conclusion. The bluffs above Vantage held hundreds, possibly thousands, of ancient petrified trees. It was a major discovery. As Beck began the painstaking work of identifying the logs, he was surprised to learn how many types of wood occurred on the site. In most known petrified forests, only a few kinds of trees had been found. But Beck identified elm and oak, spruce and Douglas fir, even swamp trees like cypress and tupelo, dozens of species in all. And while most other petrified forests are preserved in volcanic ash, the Vantage Forest was buried deep in a layer of once molten lava. How did so many types of trees come to be jumbled together in a land now covered in desert where few trees grow at all? How did their wooden trunks survive the heat of fiery lava? How did they turn into stone? And what do these fossil trees reveal about the land that surrounds them? If we piece together the physical clues, this is the story they tell. About 17 million years ago, in the age that geologists call the Miocene Epoch, hot lava poured out of cracks in the earth and covered the Columbia Plateau. For nearly 11 million years, wave after wave of molten rock spread across the landscape, each flow cooling and hardening into a layer of dark basalt. It was one of the largest outpourings of lava in the history of the earth. By the time the eruptions were finished, the Columbia River Basin was covered in hardened volcanic rock up to two miles deep. Yet in between floods of lava, there were periods of peace. And when the calm lasted long enough, life returned to the blackened earth. Rivers and streams rethreaded their way across the land's new contours, depositing layers of sediment and forming new lakes and bogs. To the west, the Cascade Mountains stood much lower than they do today. Moisture from the Pacific Ocean crossed over the Cascades easily. The climate was warm and humid, the plant life thick and lush. Swamp trees flourished along the wet edges of lowland lakes and rivers, while broadleaf forests and cone-bearing trees covered the higher hills. Strange prehistoric animals made their home here too. Squat, short-legged rhinoceroses roamed about in the woods. But the earth did not stay quiet. After a lull that may have lasted 200,000 years, blistering lava poured across the landscape once again. Trees and plants on the surface didn't stand much of a chance. But dead trees lying in low swamps and lakes were shielded from the worst heat. Lava that hissed into standing water cooled down rapidly, forming glassy pillows that hardened around the soaking trees without burning or scorching the wood. The rest of the flow cooled gradually, shrinking and hardening slowly into angular vertical columns. 
where lava was left exposed to the air up at the top of the flow, cooling took place so quickly that rising gas bubbles were trapped inside the hardened volcanic rock. Then, when the flood of lava was over, stillness settled upon the earth, and the cycle began again. But deep below the surface, something extraordinary was happening to the embedded logs. Sealed against oxygen deep in the rock, they never rotted away. Minerals from the surrounding basalt permeated the tree trunks, gradually turning wooden logs into trees of stone. Even now, geologists aren't exactly sure how it happens. Perhaps as groundwater percolates slowly down from the surface, it picks up silica from the basalt and deposits it in the wood. Or perhaps under certain volcanic conditions, like those that existed near Vantage, the mix of hot lava and water creates a silica-rich solution that penetrates the wood right away. Initial fossilization may take place very quickly, perhaps in a matter of decades. Full transformation to crystalline quartz may take millions of years. Laboratory research suggests that after the silica enters the wood, it bonds itself to cell walls first and then fills the space inside them. Gradually, the grain of the wood is recreated in stone. The best examples of petrified wood, like these uncovered at Vantage, show every growth ring and resin duct, every crack and tiny detail of the original wood. The tissue structure is so well preserved that several million years later, Professor Beck was able to tell what types of ancient trees had been trapped in the lava flow. Sometimes, shreds of organic fiber survive in the petrified specimen. The wood is still there, Beck once told a newspaper reporter. Grind the stone and you can smell it.